XS Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, XS Wireless Digital is a truly plug-and-play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one-button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit sennheiser.com slash xswd. This stream is powered by Wirecast, a powerful multi-input switching and graphics solution for live streaming in any situation. MKE600 is a shotgun microphone ideal for professional video camera applications. Yeah. Maximal rejection of ambient side noises thanks to pronounced directivity. And because the MKE600 has a very good suppression of structure borne noise, it makes one of the most versatile all round shotgun microphones on the market.
XS Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, XS Wireless Digital is a truly plug-and-play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one-button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. For more information, visit sennheiser.com slash xswd. This stream is powered by Wirecast, a powerful multi-input switching and graphics solution for live streaming in any situation. Okay, hello everyone, welcome to Pro V Live. Thank you all for your patience, slightly delayed start today. But I am joined today by Alistair Chapman. Say hello, Alistair. Hello world, how are you? <laughs> um, so what are we talking about today, Alistair? Uh, I don't know, I've completely forgotten. Um, no, we're gonna, 
We're going to talk about uh, going up to Norway to shoot the Northern Lights and my experiences of, of doing that. So we're going to look a little bit about time lapse, shooting in low light, shooting in the cold and all those sorts of things. So uh, what's it like to go and shoot the Aurora and the Northern Lights? So um, we've, I can see a couple of people chiming in in the comments already, but um, this is a great um, chance for us to have these sessions led by you in the um, comment section. So we will just start talking, but if you have any questions at all or things that you want us to talk about, any particular aspects, be it travel related, camera related, lighting related, anything to do with what we're talking about, please let us know down there and um, let's talk it through. Um, should we start by looking at some pretty pictures, Alistair? Yeah, let's have a look at that. Uh, do you want to play pictures. the FX9 one or do you want to play the other one? Uh, we'll, we'll play the FX9 one, I think, towards the end. People okay. may, some of you may have seen that already. Yep. So let's just have a look at the other one. Let me just put this video into some context, though. Yep. So the Northern Lights, we've probably all at some point seen videos of the Northern Lights on the TV. I was going to say TV. videos, not seen them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but at some point, unless you've had your head in the sand forever, you've probably seen a video of the Northern Lights. Oh, absolutely. Now, the reality is that 99% of the videos that you see on the TV, on YouTube, wherever, in fact, the majority of the ones that I produce, to be honest, are time lapse. Yep. So what you're seeing is sequences of long exposures that are put together to capture the Northern Lights, because the Northern Lights are something that are generally very, very faint, um, to make these beautiful looking pictures. And sometimes I feel like it's a bit of a fraud, it's a bit of a con trick, because what you're seeing is not really what you would see with your own eyes if you're actually there. Yeah. And of course, one of the questions everybody asks me is, so what do the Northern Lights really look like? And mm -hmm. actually, they don't look all that different from the time-lapse sequences. Um, and I've been lucky enough I, now. I mean, I think we've got some people that are watching this maybe from Iceland and possibly even from Scandinavia that, you know, if you live in the north of those countries and you spend enough time outside in the winter, you're going to see the northern lights and you're going <laughs> to see some really good northern lights if you're there all of the time. But I think if we look back at this last winter season from if we if we say from um, September through to now, there've probably been about six to eight nights in that entire period where there's been some really good, bright dancing auroras. So somebody like me who travels up to Norway in the hope of seeing them, you've got to be very lucky to get the timing just right to see a really great aurora. Yeah. Um, however, modern cameras are getting much more sensitive. So it is now getting easier to actually video the Northern Lights. So this first clip is a video of the Northern Lights. This isn't time lapse. So this gives you an idea of what the Northern Lights look like on, and this wasn't a, a, a mega night. This was a, a, let's just say, better than average night. But you, this is what you, if you were to go to Norway and spend a week or 10 days up in Norway or Iceland or wherever you, you choose to go, um, and you get a good Aurora display, this is what you can expect to see with your own eyes. Um, the way it moves, the way it dances, especially look at the bottom of the aurora when you see it, where it's sort of pinky white colors and how it dances along there. It's really very, very pretty. It really does move as fast as you'll see in the video. Um, so it just gives you a better idea of what, what, um, what you can see, what you can capture on a, on a decent night of the Northern Lights. So let's have a look at the video. Okay.
Okay. We saw a little bit at the end there that says that was shot on the A7S, but yes. do you want to tell us anything more about some of the technical aspects of that? Yeah, so that was shot with an A7S and it was feeding an Atomos Ninja 5 and uh, recording ProRes on the Atomos. Uh, lens was a 20 millimeter, uh, most likely on for, I, I switch lenses a little bit, but I think it was probably the 20 millimeter Sigma F 1.4 with a speed mm -hmm. booster. Uh, no, actually, no, it wouldn't have been with the speed booster. It would have been a straight through adapter. Yeah. Um, and that was sort of for a very long time. That was sort of my go to sort of setup for capturing uh, video of the Northern Lights. Uh, this year, I got some very similar footage with the FX9. Mm -hmm. um, although the Aurora that we had this year that we saw on the trip that we did this year wasn't as good as that Aurora. So it wasn't mm -hmm. anywhere near as bright as that. This is the problem um, with trying to find the Auroras is you're so at the mercy of the of the elements and, and what what you know, yeah. what nature is going to provide for you. Yeah, I mean, I, I've been incredibly lucky. So I've been running I, I, every year I run a trip and people can come and they can learn how to shoot the northern lights. And we have a, a big adventure up in the north of Norway. Mm -hmm. And I've been doing those now for uh, 16 years, I think it is. Amazing. And um, we've never failed to see the northern lights. And every time I go up there, the locals uh, all come to say hello and everything else. And they all sort of say, you are so lucky because there are so many people that, that come and they'll spend a week and they won't see anything. Yeah. Um, be, you have to have luck on your side. Uh, a lot of research went into the locations that we go to before I started doing this to find the, the highest probability of seeing the aurora. So that's where you have the, the big thing is clear skies. Um, if it's cloudy, forget it. So where we have a lot of clear skies in the winter and then obviously being far enough north to see the northern lights. So when, uh, when you say right. research into location, do you mean that you change that each year, depending on what the no, what current weather is? No, no, just... no, the location's always the same location, okay. but I spent a lot of time looking at weather charts and weather maps to find where in northern Scandinavia they have the highest uh, probability of clear skies mm -hmm. in, in, the, in basically in January and February. They're the two sort of prime months as far as I'm I, I think for the Northern Lights. Yep. Um, I mean, you can go to Iceland and you can see great Aurora there. I've seen Aurora in Iceland too. Um, but Iceland being a small island surrounded by relatively warm water where it is in the Atlantic, the, the, the ocean is quite warm compared to the land. They get a lot of cloud as a result. Yeah, um, I, I've I've been to I've never been to Norway, but I've been to Iceland once, and unfortunately was in the middle of a massive storm, so I definitely yeah. didn't see <laughs> Northern Lights. I mean, <laughs> it's one of those things, one of those things you say they say in Iceland is if you don't like the weather, just wait ten minutes. Yes, because it, it will was be definitely that. Yeah. And and the weather's always changing there, and uh, I mean it's an amazing place, and I would I would yeah if you're a photographer. Oh, the it's what you scenery. must go to Iceland. Absolutely yeah, you can't stunning. Not, yeah, you've got to go. But if you're just going, if the only thing you want is the Northern Lights, I would say Iceland may be not the best choice. It's not a bad choice, certainly not a terrible choice mm -hmm. by any means, but I think Northern Scandinavia you is pick. probably accessibility and everything else and, yeah, and I mean, stable weather when when we i mean norway is a long country when we're talking about norway whereabouts in norway you mean right up near the northern bits right you? up in the north i mean that's one of the things that always amazes me about when we we go up to norway is we fly from london or i fly i mean we have people mm -hmm. come from all over the world but i fly from london to oslo which is in the very south of norway oh, okay. and that's about a two-hour flight and then from oslo you fly we fly all the way up to the town of alta and that's another hour and a half, hour and three quarter flight. Yeah. You know, it yeah. takes almost as long to fly up the length of Norway as it does to fly from here to Norway. It's, yeah. it's a, it, you say it's a very long country, it certainly um, is. spectacularly beautiful country. So we're, we're talking about going way north, um, you know, quite a way north of the Arctic Circle. Mm -hmm. um, and in the winter, you've got to do it in the winter. You can't go in the summer because it's 24 hour daylight. So you won't see anything. Um, and my preferred months are January and February, but that does mean cold. Mm. Um, and the reason I prefer those months is the nights are longer. So it's getting dark, um, two, three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, so you have a very long night, which maximizes your possibilities of having a clear window. If it is a bit cloudy, if the clouds coming and going and the location that we, we have picked or I've picked 
is in the lee of some mountains so that generally with the prevailing winds that you get up there in the winter, the snow and everything falls on the mountains and then the clap, which um, eliminates the clouds. So by the time the weather gets to where we are, it has less cloud cover. Mm -hmm. um, if the weather doesn't play ball, we can then drive to the coast from there, the other side of the mountains. Mm -hmm. And generally, if it's either clear inland, if it's not clear inland, it'll be clear at the coast. Um, it's not always been the case, but um, yeah, so there's a lot of time and effort went in before we start, I started running these trips to this particular location. But I found some new locations that I'm hoping to try in the future. But with everything that's going on right now, all those plans yeah, are not, not right now, on maybe, hold but... and we'll, we'll, we'll um, see what happens. Hekon, who I believe is the one from um, watching who is from Iceland, has just put that Tromsø in Norway brand themselves the northern light capital of Norway. I have no idea whether I'm saying these names correctly, by the way. But I believe Tromsø is the, um, the place that's just as the Norway starts to cap around the top, there's the... It's just north of the Lotofen Island range, isn't it? Um, yeah, that's right. So, yeah, it's, it's a little, place yeah, with it's, an airport. Um, yeah, so one of the reasons why Tromsø is such a, such a popular spot and, you know, amazing city to visit is because it has a fairly large airport. Mm. Um, you can actually fly. There are a few flights direct from the UK to yeah. Tromsø. Um, not many, um, but it's sort of the biggest town biggest city in that part of norway fairly well connected um it's nice i like tromsa um but the problem tromsa has now is it's it's getting bigger as a city so it has a lot of light pollution a lot of city lights mm -hmm. so you do have to get out of tromsa to see the northern lights so that does mean going on some sort of organized tour in the evenings to get out of the city which you mm -hmm. can do um but then you're on a bus and you pull up in a lay-by somewhere at the, at, you're in a field and you go and stand in a field for the night to watch the Northern Lights. And it's not really romantic or anything like that. Um, I much prefer where we go. We stay in these cabins, very, very remote. And yeah, the, the cabins Lights, we just saw in that film, the A7S film, yeah. were the cabins you were staying in, right? Yes, that's right. Um, middle of nowhere, a place called Karashok. Um, and we, we actually fly to the next city up from out from Tromsø, which is Alta, it's a little bit further north. Okay. Um, as the crow flies, it's only about 50 miles, six, 60, 70 kilometers north. But if you tried to drive it, it's about a six hour drive because um, of, of all the fjords and everything else. You've got to be so careful with Norway. Yeah. You look at something on the map and you go, oh, that's not far. Yep. And then you, you put it into your sat nav and your sat nav says, oh, it's going to take you nine hours to get there. And it's like, huh, how does that happen? And it's because there are no roads and it's all yep. mountainous and fjords and everything else. Um, but we get way out into the dark skies and, you know, because where we are, there's no street lights outside the cabins. You step outside and it's, it's really, really dark and you don't get a, don't get a light pollution problem. Um, but there's, there are other places you can go. I mean, there, there's lots of places in northern Finland as well. Um, I mean, you can see Finland from Karajok where we go. It's just... 10 miles 20, 20 miles away so there's there's lots of options absolutely um, but, but airports are the ones that are the yeah you need to you need to find Key somewhere for a decent airport otherwise getting around is difficult absolutely um but yeah iceland you fly up to reykjavik and um you know go into uh, flying to the airports about an hour out of reykjavik uh, it's a super easy flight get, yeah and and then you know you can find a nice hotel in reykjavik or or even Vic, which is on the south coast, somewhere like that. And, uh, yeah, lots of opportunities there as well. Absolutely. So there's lots of places you can go. Um, Alaska, Canada, all, all sorts, really. Uh, take your pick. So J.D. Floyd is just asking quickly on the A7S settings. Um, what, what, he, he asked, what were your typical A7S settings for a video of the Northern yeah, Lights? So typical settings because you know it's one of those things the northern lights can go from being incredibly faint to actually being really quite remarkably bright where you could just use 24 25 frames per second with a 124th 125th shutter and probably 12,000 iso or maybe even less sometimes to shoot it and it's easy um but I think in the video that you saw at the beginning, that was pro the camera was probably at around about 22,000 ISO, and I was probably using a 1 12th 
shutter. Right, so, so that's the, shutter the, the key bit, isn't it? Because 22, yeah. I mean, that's high. Don't get me wrong in terms of ISO yeah. values. But in terms of what people play about with on the A7S, it's not the absolute crazy, like, see in the dark yeah, levels. So, so one of the, yeah, and one of the things I've discovered about trying to shoot some, something in, this is very low light, where you, you just don't have light, is yep. you can ob obviously you can ramp up the gain in the camera. So ISO in an electronic camera is gain. Yep. And uh, when you start ramping that up, the picture gets noisy, the picture gets grainy. Yep. Now, one of the processes that you are going to have to do if you are shooting in those sorts of light levels, if we're you know, being completely honest and realistic, is we're going to do some noise reduction in post-production. Yep. And one of the problems that you run into if you're not careful is it's very easy to start adding too much gain. And the picture, because you get, obviously you add more gain, you get a brighter picture. And there comes a point where your noise reduction software can't deal with it. It won't reduce it. So what I've found is that rather than just putting in crazy amounts of gain, I like to not have too much gain. Then I'll noise reduce it in post-production and then add some more gain in post. And I find that the, no the noise reduction software, things like Neat Video, mm -hmm. or if you're using the studio, full studio version of Resolve, the uh, tools that are in there are very, very good too, is that you can have just more noise than the denoise software can deal with. And the other thing that happens is that the noise makes the image coarser. Um, so when you, when, you're, when you add gain, the size of the grain increases. So it's the amplitude of the grain increases. And that has an effect on, on the amount of details and textures that you can record mm. because all mm. of those details and textures are going up and down with the noise by a large amount. So you're, you lose all your fine details, you lose all your fine textures. So when you're trying to shoot something like the Aurora, which is relatively faint against a dark background, there's not a lot of con contrast there. There's not a lot of texture, for want of a better word. And if you then have a lot of gain, you can't recover the texture. So the, the Aurora, you, you get issues with banding. If you mm. try and noise reduce it, you get a, a coarseness to it. The colors become blocky and it doesn't look good. So I do try and keep the noise down by keeping the gain or the ISO as low as I can. Um, and that will often mean actually not getting as bright as an exposure as you would perhaps normally want to have. If I can get the Aurora to hit sort of 30, 40% of my exposure range, 30, 40% IRE, then that's where I stop with the gain. I don't try and expose the Aurora so it's at 80, 90%. Gotcha. Um, yeah. So, but, but presumably before any of that, the, the simple basics are use a very fast lens. Yeah. Um, and um, you mentioned you were down at a 12th of a second shutter speed. Is that? Yes. Yeah, so, so there's, you know, the Aurora, you, you're, not, you're not filming somebody running around. You're not filming normal action. The, I mean, mm. it, you saw in the video, the Aurora does move fairly quickly, but it's not super fast. Mm -hmm. um, so you can very often get away with using a slower shutter speed. So one twelfth, and that doubles the amount of light hitting that sensor when you, you go from sort of one twenty fifth or one twenty fourth down to one twelfth. Now it does mean that you have motion blur because your shutter is open for a long period of time. Yeah. And it does mean that effectively you're, you're kind of shooting at 12 frames per second. Mm -hmm. But in, with the motion that you have with the Aurora and things like that, most people don't even notice that. And if you pan slow enough, um, even the stars don't become excessively elongated and things like that. And I'd much rather have um, a little bit of motion blur um, if it means I can have a brighter image with less noise and everything else. Now, here's... Here's a tip for you, though, when it comes to noise reduction. So a lot of noise reduction software uses temporal methods. So it will mm. take groups of frames and compare the motion in the frames to do the noise reduction. If you've shot, let's say, 24 frames per second with a 1 12th shutter, what it means is you've got pairs of frames where the information is the same. Mm. And that temporal noise reduction doesn't work very well if that's what your footage is. So one of the things that I do is I take my 1 12th shutter speed footage, I speed it up by 200% and render it out to a new clip before I do the, the noise reduction. Mm. 
So the new clip, yes, it's sped up, but each frame is unique and your temporal noise reduction will work much, much better on that as a result. And then you can slow it back down again afterwards. And that makes a huge difference to how much noise you can re remove from footage if you've shot with a slower shutter speed. Oh, that's a fantastic tip. Never would have thought yeah. of that. Okay, um, so that was shot on the A7S, um, yeah. but obviously you've used a bunch of cameras. Um, what yeah. what cameras have you have you used out in Norway? Um, well, I think we've got a PowerPoint slide here. I think number uh -huh. four is it? Um, uh, which one up. is it? It's uh, number three. Uh, um, three. And that's that's just some idea of the cameras that I've used. It is so so A6300. Um, any X5N going back even further, uh, A7, uh, A7S obviously, FS5, FS7, uh, F5, and now FX9. And the FX9 has been a big surprise for me because I knew it would be good, but I hadn't realized quite how good. Mm. Um, and with the new firmware update going up to ridiculous ISO levels now, um, it's an, it is an incredibly sensitive camera. Um, so that's performed very, very well for me. Um, mm -hmm. But as you mentioned earlier, really, as much as anything, it comes down to the lens and your choice of lens. Um, you want a lens with a big aperture. So an f1.4 lens, uh, if you're using um, an APS-C camera. So I often use the Sigma 20 millimeter f1.4 on my A6300. Um, a tiny little point and shoot camera, but that works really well um, with a speed booster. Um, and you can get good results from that. When the Aurora is really bright, I've seen, we, yeah, we've had people on the trips videoing it with their mobile phone. Um, <laughs> but generally, generally, you're, you're looking at a sort of a one second exposure for a time lapse sequence. So you want a camera that you can connect an intervalometer to. So some way of taking an image every second. The other thing to look for for doing time lapse with a stills camera is a camera where you can actually turn off the mechanical shutter. Because over the course of a few nights, if you're shooting all night long, trying to shoot time-lapse of the Northern Lights, you are going to take tens of thousands of frames. And if the mechanical shutter is having to actuate every time, and especially actually when it's really cold, because the grease in the shutter becomes very thick, you will destroy the mechanical shutter. So you want a camera where you can turn off the mechanical shutter. In the Sony cameras, they normally have a silent shooting mode, which turns off the mm -hmm. mechanical shutter. And you can use that so you're not wearing out the shutter in your camera. Um, so lots of cameras can do it. But A7S, A7S II, really still very, very good, exceptionally good, and FX9 now as well. So you want a very sensitive camera, very fast lens. And for an intervalometer, you don't need anything fancy. Um, if your cam camera doesn't have one built in, you can go on to eBay or wherever, and I'm quite sure you sell them, Carl, little uh, USB or whatever the interface on your particular camera is, time-lapse controller. Oh, um, yes. Mm -hmm. You don't need to do ramping or anything like that. If you, you, know, you don't need to. It's generally just a, a one-second interval every yeah. one second. Just a simple one will work absolutely fine, yeah. And That's some, right. some cameras have got them built in now as well, some of the Sony That's ones right. as yeah. well. Mm. Yeah, uh, or it's an app that you can download and yep. install in the camera on some of them. Um, I mean, when you go up to somewhere like Norway in the winter, you're going to be dealing with some very, very cold weather. So, yes. and obviously we're shooting at night. So you have a couple of challenges there. Well, is, le uh, let's get onto the cold in, in, in a minute. Um, yeah. Because I think that, that deserves its entire section because I imagine it's quite cold out there. Um, a little bit, yeah. Before we get onto that, um, Hercon is asking, how is the high noise performance between the A7S II and the FX9? Yeah, so um, I think the FX9 is much better. You think um, the FX9 is better? Interesting. Yes, I was, I was I just about to say, I, I, I assume the, F, the A7S II is still, still the king. I, in terms of, because what's important is not the, not the ISO number. Of course, yeah. You can program a camera to have any ISO number you want. You know, it's just gain. You just keep piling on the gain. So the important thing is how sensitive is the sensor? How, how actually sensitive are the pixels? Mm -hmm. And I think we have to remember that that sensor that's in the A7S and A7S II now is a very old sensor by today's mm. standards. That's got to be eight years old now, I guess, something mm. like that. Um, it's a full-frame sensor. It's 12 megapixels. 
I think it's 12. Um, yeah. And you compare that now to the FX9. So the first thing that the FX9 has going for it is it's a back illuminated sensor. So that means that the sensor is inherently uh, more sensitive because more light is able to fall onto the pixels and with a conventional sensor design. And it's not that many more pixels. It's a much later generation of sensor. It's 19 megapixels in full frame. So the pixel pitch, the actual size of the pixels, isn't that different. But because it's back illuminated, it's more sensitive. And being a much later generation of sensor, the onboard noise reduction is much better. And the sensor itself has two sensitivity levels. So you can run it at its high base sensitivity, 4000 EI in the Cine EI mode. Um, and it is really super sensitive. Um, and I was really surprised how little then gain or additional boosting of the sensitivity that I needed to do to get really great results in very, very low light levels and with really nice fine noise. If you're shooting video with it, then it's oversampling. So if you shoot with a 6K full frame, it's super sampling down to 4K and that helps reduce noise as well. So the you, FX9 really produces, does a good job. Have you found that there's much of a difference when applying noise reduction to them? Because I, I haven't done much playing about with the FX9 versus the cameras like the A7S, but um, I often find when I'm comparing bigger, more video orientated cameras in terms of their high ISO performance compared to smaller mirrorless cameras, is that the mirrorless cameras, even if you turn the noise reduction off, are still doing quite a lot of noise reduction inside heavily compressed video. And so then any noise reduction that you put on the top is going to really struggle. Whereas the better codecs and um, the better noise reduction and noise reduction that you can actually turn off so that it's a slightly noisier to begin with, but it means that the, the noise is, is, is in a slightly easier format for noise reduction to read. Yeah, yeah, I, I mean, absolutely. From a video standpoint, if we look at the video, I mean, that's why mm. I plug in the Atomos Ninja 5 to the, show, to the A7S, mm. because it's a better codec. Yeah. It's still only limited to eight bits, but it is a much less compressed codec. Absolutely. And of course, if you've got, if you've got a noisy picture, that tends to really stress the codec and the, the codec will then int introduce more artifacts into the image that aren't there in the original what comes out of the camera. So, so the better codec of having the Ninja 5 really helps the A7S. The FX9 is a 10-bit codec in 4K. It's a very good codec in the camera, so that is even better. Um, so from a video point of view, I find that, I, yes, I can noise reduce video from a higher-end camera with a better codec better than I can mm. a, a, a stills camera generally but if i'm doing time lapse of course it's a bit different so if i'm using my a7s or something else to do time lapse um and it's a stills camera i'm going to shoot raw so i'm okay. taking raw still images raw photographs and then i will process those um later on and i can do my noise reduction on that and it's generally you know, it's 12 bit or 14 bit raw so it's a better image to start off with so for time lapse, the workflow is is to shoot raw with a stills camera, and that gives me the best results. So they they kind of yeah, it depends on exactly what you're shooting. If you're shooting video, a proper dedicated higher end 10 bit camera with 10 bit codec uh, may be better to work with in post than shooting video on a stills camera. But if you're shooting time lapse and you can you're taking longer exposures, if you want those one second exposures, then you know shooting raw is the, probably the better way to go, although the FX9 with its slow shutter, because you can go down to something like two and a half seconds on the FX9, does a very good job in, of that as well. Um, but the problem with the shooting RAW is there's a lot of extra work when you get home to process thousands and thousands of images. Sure, so it, absolutely. So it's horses for courses, really. Right, I think this might be a good time to play the FX9 um, pixel clip that yeah. we've got loaded up. So some people may have seen this before, because we've used this before on some streams. But I think this is a really nice... Um, you, you see some northern lights in here, but there's also much more around the, the Norway trip in general. Um, anything you want to say about it before we play it, Alistair? Yeah, so it's all FX9. All the time lapse and everything else is done in camera. So using the camera's built-in intervalometer. The northern lights, the aurora shots are done with the, the, the FX9 as well, using the uh, 20mm f1.4 f Sigma. Um, slow shutter, I think I was using a 64 frame slow shutter, which at 24 frames per second is just over two seconds. Mm -hmm. um, but the Aurora was really, really dark. Um, it was 
you know, it looked much better on the camera than it did with the naked eye. Yeah. So anyway, let's have a look at the video. So I want to get on to talking a little bit about logistics and things like the temperatures and stuff like that, because that must play a huge consideration into you planning these trips and what you can actually physically do while you're out there. I mean, how cold does it get? So this year it was minus 36, oh, something like I that. Mean. It was particularly cold. Um, and it's, it's quite an interesting... Um, Thing. I mean, I, one of the, I love going to this little town that we go to, this place called Karishok in Norway, because it's so remote. I mean, the population of the town is about 2,000 people. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, on the last day, which um, was one of the coldest days, we dropped down, we came down from the, the cabins on the, the hill uh, by snowmobile down into the, into the valley where the town is. And of course, it, it's colder down in the valley because the cold air sinks. Right. And we went, yeah. for a, went for a coffee to warm up. And you, 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 know, you pull into the, this little parade of shops that's there and you park your car and you go in and you have your coffee, but you leave the car outside with the engine running mm. because there's a fairly good chance that if you stop Might it, it won't start, start again afterwards. <laughs> and, and you look out the window and there's half a dozen cars in the car park and there's some very nice cars sitting there, nobody in them, just with the engines running. And that's, <laughs> that's how life is there um, yeah. when it's that cold. Um, I mean, you've got to be very, very careful. And one of the things that it's almost a bit of a joke is that every year on the trips that I run, somebody will destroy a tripod. Mm -hmm. And that, that happens because the snow is very deep. And if you've got a mid-level spreader and you put your tripod on the top of the snow and then it sinks into the snow, the fact that it, the, the legs go down into the, into the snow and they try to spread out puts a huge amount of strain on that mid-level spreader in the center and it tends to just if it's minus 30 it's the any plastic anything like becomes so brittle mm. and you just hear it you'll hear somebody puts their tripod in the snow and they push it down and you hear the pink and the, the little plastic ring in the bottom of the tripod's just exploded into a million bits and their tripod no longer has a spreader anymore um you know a cable a, a, a soft wire flexible cable so like the cables for the uh, intervalometers, uh, it, normally they're, they're, you tie, tie them in knots. Well, you, you put them in your camera bag and they tie themselves in knots. Um, up there, they're like steel wire. You can't bend them. So you've got to be really, really careful about everything because stuff breaks. Um, you have issues with the lenses icing up and freezing. So at night, if you stand next to the camera, you if and you've got your nice warm clothes on your body is going to be nice and warm um i mean there's a norwegian a norwegian saying there's no such thing as bad weather only bad clothes so <laughs> if you've got the right clothing you can actually stay reasonably warm so what it, what so is the right clothing 
So it's uh, lots of clothing. As much as you can. <laughs> Just uh, snowball. So, no, so, yeah, generally, it's mul it's lots of layers of clothing because you need yeah. to be able to keep adjusting your layers. So, I mean, uh, you start off with your thermal base layer, and that's normally something like a nylon um, or lycra um, uh, sports top and bottom. So the yeah, the really stretchy lycra stuff. Yeah, you don't wear cotton or anything like that because cotton gets damp. So you wear like a, a Nylon uh, sort of like a compression nylon. top type. Like, yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's the word. A compression top, compression trousers, mm -hmm. uh, compression bottoms, uh, some nice big thick uh, uh, wool socks. Uh, and then under that, you might have a fleece jumper or something like that. Um, and then uh, I wear a, like a one piece thermal suit that mm -hmm. has um, uh, nylon insulation in it. It's quite thick. It's a bit like wearing a duvet. And then over the top of that, I have a, a, an Arctic jacket. And then the big thing is boots, is proper Arctic boots. So the boots I have are rated for minus 45 degrees. Can't take your um, converse, no. No, 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 no. You're frostbite. I mean, frostbite comes on really fast. There's something that really yeah. surprises people. Um, I mean, this year we had to keep, if we're out on the snowmobiles where you have the wind chill from being on the snow scooter, you've got an equivalent of something like minus 60 degrees. And you're talking seconds to get frostbite on your face if there's anything unprotected. Oh. So every, every 10 or 15 minutes, we'd have to stop and everyone has to sort of pull down their balaclavas so you can just see this bit just here because you get, always get a bit of uh, wind in there. And you're looking to see, oh, has anybody, anyone got white skin there? Because that's a sign of uh, frostbite starting. Um, yeah, so there's challenges, but I mean, it's part of the adventure. I mean, it's an adventure. Yeah, we're, we're never we're never more than an hour from a nice warm cabin, so it's not like we're going to the North Pole, um, where you've got to spend days and weeks out there. You know, you're only ever an hour away from being warm. Yeah. Um, but you've got to be so careful with everything. I mean, batteries don't last long. You know, yeah, we've got a question about, about power solutions, actually. Yeah. So, but, but what, what I was saying is, so your your body is warm. Mm. Your camera is minus thirty degrees. If you stand next to your camera, the, the small bit of sweat and moisture that gets out of your clothing into the air hits your camera and frosts up your camera. So you have to actually set up the camera to do the shot and then stand two or three meters away from it so that it doesn't ice up from your Blimey. own body heat. Um, I mean, I use lens heaters on, on my lenses if on the overnight sessions when I'm doing the Aurora that just, they don't, the, the lens is still actually below freezing, but it raises the lens above the, the, the frost point, the dew point. So it, it doesn't ice up as much, and that, that helps. Um, tripod heads, they freeze. You know, a lot of the cheap tripods will freeze. And then you can't move your tripod, and then it becomes, you know, it, it's, it's not so useful. Um, what what tripod the, do you the, use? So I use the Miller um, tripods. I have Miller uh, Solos, Miller Compass, and uh, the, um, what's the new one? Because uh, the company Miller, Miller CB Plus, yeah, and they're all winterized. They're they're really good. Never had a problem with those. Um, yeah, the the better, higher quality tripods will have better quality fluids in the heads that, that don't freeze. And before you go on your Norway trip, how do you find out whether it works or not? We'll stick it in the freezer overnight. And seriously, I mean, I you know, if you have any new gear that you're going to take to somewhere like Norway in the winter. If you get to Norway and it doesn't work, it's too late. You can't do anything about it. So mm. before you go, a couple of weeks before you go, put it in the freezer and, and you know, put it in a plastic bag, put it in the freezer, leave it overnight and see whether it works in the morning because that's going to tell you whether it's going to work in Norway or, or Iceland in the middle of the winter or not. Do you have to be um, careful of things like condensation and stuff? I mean, presumably yeah. going in oh, and yeah. from that cold into the hot cabin, stuff like that, you, you yeah. must get lots yeah. of problems. Uh, that, and that's your camera killer. Mm. That is what will kill your kit. Um, because in those cabins, we've got a nice big log fire going on. Everyone mm. likes to be nice and cozy and warm. It's lovely and warm in there. Um, you take a camera that's 30 degrees below zero into plus 25 degrees, and you just get an enormous amount of condensation will form on that camera almost instantly. And then because the camera is so cold, it freezes. So, because it, it's going to take the camera half an hour to warm up. 
So you, the condensation just keeps coming and coming and coming, and the camera will be covered in frost and ice almost instantly. It means that then you can't go back outside and shoot if the aurora suddenly kicks off again. Forget it, because your camera's covered in ice. Mm -hmm. You don't want to start scraping ice off lenses. And it, it's not only on the outside. You have to remember that it's going to be on the inside as well. So your sensor will probably have frost on it um, and things like that. And that's really unhealthy for your camera. So before you go oh, yeah, indoors, if the camera even turns back on. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So if you so before you go indoors, you put the camera in a plastic bag, a sealed bag, either a, a big big Ziploc bag or a bin bag. Seal it up, take it inside, and then you leave it in the bag for at least half an hour to an hour to warm up and acclimatize okay. before you open the bag. Um, yeah, you know, one of the guys that we meet up there, a guy called Jan Helmer, he helps us out. He he shoots the aurora all the time. His he has a slightly different um, strategy, and that is to take the camera in unprotected, and then put it on top of the log burning stove so that it heats it up physically as fast as possible. Um, and he'll often just take the lens off and just leave it just hanging just above the log burning stove. Yeah, I'm um, not sure that's official recommended practice, is it? <laughs> I, I normally spend the first evening when I go up there to, to visit the guys cleaning his sensor for him and scraping, <laughs> the, scraping the crud out of the inside of his camera. Um, it's really not a good, good way to do it. Yeah. Um, so it, it can be pretty brutal. So what I do is I actually leave the gear outside. I don't bring it in. It stays outside for the whole week. Okay. It just doesn't come. Just leave it outside. Once it's acclimatized, you may as well leave it out there. Bringing yeah. it's, it's staying out at a constant temperature does a lot less harm than constantly going hot, cold, hot, cold, hot, cold. Yeah. Oh, that's really interesting. Um, okay, we've got a couple of questions. If, if you, any of you have got any more questions, please do leave them below. Now is a good time for us to get to them. Um, Hakon is just pointing out, interesting point when we're talking about um, places and things like that. He says, regarding light pollution, Reykjavik in Iceland has sometimes during really strong shows actually turned off all their street lights so that the locals can more easily see the northern lights, which I think is a really nice yep. idea. Yep. I love the idea of an entire city the size of Reykjavik just in, in darkness to look at the northern lights. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it doesn't happen very often, but yes, every now and again they will they will do that. I mean, at the moment, in terms of the solar cycle, we're we're in the sort of the low ebb of the the solar cycle, so the northern lights aren't at their greatest at the moment. Although, mm -hmm. you know, even this year there have been some amazing displays. Um, you get things like coronal holes that will create some great auroras, and they can happen at any time. Um, in, over the next five or six years, we'll slowly sort of ramp up and aurora conditions should improve in the coming years. Okay. Um, and, you know, yeah, they, they do turn the street lights off. In, in Tromso and Alta, the street lighting is all designed to have as little as possible light going upwards into the sky. So the, the street lights are all shielded and um, they try and minimize it, but you just can't get away from it when you've got snow on the ground yeah, light, and everything else, light. any light just <laughs> reflects up. So it's, it's difficult. Bruno is asking, where can we watch those clips in good quality? The stream compression isn't make, doing them justice, which is very understandable. Yeah, so, so most of them will be on my uh, YouTube channel, which is in this one word, Ingenious TV, I-N-G-E-N-I-O-U-S TV. Probably find uh, them if you just search Alistair Chapman Northern Lights as well, I'd imagine. You probably will, yes. Yeah, or, or the general, yeah, quite often I'll link, link to them from my xdcam-user.com yes. website. But um, YouTube is where I, I, I upload them. Um, and there's lots more up there, actually. There's, there's some, some really good ones. I think it was 2000 and, uh, 2011 or 2013, I can't remember, shot with a, a Sony F3. And we had the most incredible aurora that night. It was, it was so bright you could look, look down and see your shadow moving across the snow with it. Um, and uh, there was, it went on for hours and hours and hours. And eventually everyone got, actually got tired of, of watching it and went to bed because we had an early start the following morning. We got up the following morning and um, everyone gets up, goes outside and the aurora is still going. Still going on. Uh, it's a good job you didn't wait. <laughs> wait for it to go. Uh, so, so that was pretty special. Um, but yeah, so uh, yeah, and lots, I say lots of places you can go. One of the things we, we touched on already was power and batteries. Yes. So um, one of the things that I've come to notice over the years that, that was a bit of an eye opener, actually, I guess I, I should, it should be expected, was the difference between how long um, 
generally the manufacturer's own brand batteries loss compared to lower cost third party batteries. So two batteries that are supposedly the same capacity, one is a cheaper third party battery compared to a own brand battery and the difference in life of those two batteries when they got cold was staggering. Mm. Um, very often I find that the cheap off brand batteries you might, they might work fine in normal weather, in normal temperatures, and you might get a couple of hours of runtime out of them. You go to Norway and, and you get five minutes out of them, whereas the, the better brand name batteries do generally work much better. So it's not necessarily just the manufacturer's own brand batteries, but certainly the, the reputable brands. You're talking of your PAGs, your IDX, mm -hmm. um, and, and things like that. It makes a, a surprising difference. Um, in terms of keeping batteries warm, you, know, you just keep your batteries inside, inside pockets until you need them. That makes a big, big difference. Um, I do have some little tiny um, electric heaters. You can buy these on eBay. Um, they're just a few dollars each. They generally come from China and the little self-adhesive heating pads, they run off uh, either five volts or 12 volts. Um, so you can run them off a USB battery pack. And they're really useful for either just taping to a battery. And it sounds really, you know, counterintuitive. Why use more power? Because if, you're, if you don't have enough power, surely more power isn't going to help. But it does. If you can keep the battery warm, they will last for so much longer. And the other thing is when it gets very, very cold is LCD screens. The LCD becomes very, very sluggish. So one of these little heating pads just taped to the back of the LCD can make a huge oh, difference. That's very interesting. Yeah, and I, I kind of get, I, I started doing it with my cameras. I mean, they're, they're a few dollars each on eBay, um, just electrical heating pads, I think you've searched for. They come in all sorts of different sizes and everything else. Um, the five volt ones tend to be the most useful because you just plug them into those um, U, U USB battery banks. Is that I, I then started figuring out that, well, if I can heat the camera, I can also heat my gloves. Yeah. So I then sort of bought a couple and I have a couple inside my mittens that I use and I can, you know, I look like a kid at school, you know, on, on the end of my um, arm, there's the wire coming out. So I can yeah. plug it into my mittens. So I look like, I look like a kid when my mittens are hanging down from yeah. my sleeves. Um, but I wouldn't want to lose them. <laughs> yeah. Don't, and it, don't bother with chemical hand warmers. But when it's that cold, they just don't work. Oh, okay. Because they, they rely on moisture. So they're generally iron oxide and they rely on the iron oxide rusting and it's the That's rusting process. Interesting actually, because I bought a couple of those, the ones where you shake them and then they get, they get hot before going to Iceland and they yeah. didn't seem to do very much at all when I was out there and that would be why. No. Yeah, so if fine. it's very, very cold, there's the, the moisture in the air freezes. So th there's no moisture then left for the um, uh, hand warmers to work. And, and very often, I mean, we, you know, you get people who go, and I, I, I explain to them, it's not going to work. If you wrap them around the lens, it's, it isn't going to do anything. It'll stop heating. And they, they stick them around their lens. They maybe use a sock. Mm -hmm. So if you cut the end off a sock, cut the toe off a sock, you can use that to just, just to help keep, your, keep the worst of the frost off the lens. Because obviously if the camera is running, the camera's generating some warmth. Mm -hmm. And just having a, a, a thick sock, you just cut the toes off or a, um, a sweat band or something like that around the lens keeps a little bit of warmth in. Mm -hmm. And they put all the hand warmers in there and nothing happens, it doesn't work. And then they take the hand warmers out, they put them in the pockets of their jacket, go to bed, and they get up in the morning and they put their hands in the pocket of that jacket and the pocket is red hot because all the moisture inside the cabins has now reactivated the mm -hmm. hand warmer and it's going full tilt <laughs> in, in that nice warm environment. Yeah, not where you need the hand warmers, annoyingly. No. no. <laughs> um, okay, so um, th th there's, I think there's definitely some people watching who are looking at getting into um, filming and photographing the Northern Lights and sort of these more extreme cold environments for the first time. Um, and I, I think I would put myself in that category as well. Um, I would love to get the chance to go back to somewhere like Iceland or to Norway to film things like that. Um, do you have any advice or tips or anything like that that we haven't already discussed? So, yeah, let's start with the shameless plug, which mm -hmm. would be to come on one of my trips. Yep. Um, I put a link to so that every earlier, year. by the way. So if everyone scrolls back through the, um, the chat on Facebook or on YouTube, they should see a link to those tours. Yeah, and they're, they're very small. They're small groups. Um, I, I you know, look after everybody personally, make sure they've got the right clothes and everything and, and you know, take you through the whole thing. The big thing is, though, um, if you've never done it before, 
go on a tour, go join a group. Mm -hmm. I think it's much more enjoyable to go. It, it's one of those experiences, experiences that is better shared. Mm -hmm. Now, some, some things are nicer to do on your own, to, to go into the wilderness, perhaps, and ha have a wilderness experience on your own is something a lot of people like to do. And I, and I get that. But I think the Northern Lights is just one of those things that is a shared experience. There is something really nice about you know, watching Aurora, discussing what you're seeing uh, mm -hmm. uh, with company. So, so go on a tour group of some sort. Do your homework, um, because obviously the tour companies, they want to fill every single place on every single tour all winter long. Now, generally, my experience is that in the early part of the winter, so we're, if we're looking, you know, it's got to be dark, obviously. So, so Northern Light season actually starts in late September, um, in the northern hemisphere and runs all the way through until uh, sort of April. It's getting a bit light now. Um, generally, my experience is that, yes, yeah, September, right at the beginning of the season, you can get some nice weather, uh, but the nights aren't very long, um, but you can get some decent weather. Then when you get to the longer night period where you've got long nights, in November, December, the weather is generally very changeable. If you think about what the weather's like here in November, December, it tends to often be stormy. We get a lot of rain. It, it's not nice weather. But then when you get to January, February, and maybe even into March, that's when you get the sort of the more clear sky weather where you have the, the frosts here in the UK and those, those cold frosty mornings, which is actually what you want only in Norway. So I tend to find the weather is more stable, January, February, March. That tends to give you better chance of clear skies and things like that, less in the way of storms. Um, on an average, you can't, you, know, you can't really predict these things. And if you, then there's a lot of debate about this. So the other one is the moon, is to consider what the moon is going to do to your shots. Now, when you have a full moon, the moon is really bright. And if the full moon is in the sky where the aurora is and the aurora isn't very bright, it makes taking pictures of the aurora or even seeing the aurora really challenging. So I wouldn't go when there is a full moon. Um, I would actually like to go when there is no moon, new moon. And I, my trips are always run the week either side of new moon, because even if the aurora is very, very faint, you'll still be able to see it no matter what the moon is still a light source isn't it, it well, it's oh not yeah just a reflected i mean light source but it's it's, it's... well and, and you've got to remember you're going somewhere generally is going to have a lot of snow on the ground so yeah. you have any it magnifies it. it it can be quite bright now from a photo purely from a photography point of view if you get a good aurora and you have moonlight as well it can be spectacular mm. um, i mean some very best aurora photographs that I've seen and imagery that I've seen have been when there's been moonlight to light the ground so you can see exactly. trees yeah. and stuff like that. You don't just want a, uh, a black shot of the aurora and you know that that looks like every other aurora shot whereas yeah, if you've got a, the, the, a lovely landscape image lit by moonlight which happens to have and the moon gorgeous shadows and, mm. and everything else and it can look really dramatic. Mm. But hit the, the rub is, though, that if the, if the aurora is faint, you just can't see it. Mm -hmm. So that's why I run the trips when I run them, because I know that a lot of people that are coming on my trips have probably never seen the aurora before. So their main priority is to see it. Yes. So it, I, I tend, you know, I run my trips when there's no moon, either a new moon or the moon is below the horizon at night. So that, you know, even if the aurora is very, very faint, they're going to be able to see the aurora. If that moon was there, they wouldn't see it. So that's my priority. But it, it, it's one of those things you could, I mean, there's um, a website called Time and Date and you can put in where you're going to go and that will tell you what the moon is going to do throughout the month or months and you can see. And the, per the perfect scenario actually is probably one where the moon is actually down below the horizon until really late at night. So the aurora kicks off you know, super, pretty much as soon as it's fully dark. Um, and you might have a faint aurora and you get to see it, but then come 11, 12 o'clock midnight, the moon comes up mm -hmm. and you can start doing some shots with the moon in it. And if the aurora is still bright enough, still have the aurora as well. So, so the moon is something really important to consider when you plan when you're going to go um, on your aurora trip. Um, I think it's something a lot of people overlook uh, is the, the importance of, of how much moonlight there will be.
Absolutely. Um, but but try, find an organized trip, find an organized tour. Um, if you do go to Norway on your own, I highly recommend Tromso. And the reason for that is that there are plenty of places in Tromso where you can hire the clothes that you will need. Uh -huh. yeah. You don't need to buy any. So you can arrive in Tromso, uh, a company called Tromso Outdoor. Uh, can hire you everything you need. They've got all sorts of sizes and shapes and everything for everybody, boots, coats, hats, gloves, the works. Hmm. And that makes that makes it uh, uh, easier. And presumably um, that would be the same in, in cities like Reykjavik and places like that as well. Prob prob almost certainly Reykjavik, yes. The city that we go to, Alta, no, you, you can't get it yep. there. These are very, very small places, some of these. So um, we have to make sure. But the, the flip side to that is it's going to cost you, Norway, you know, for us from the UK is a relatively expensive country. Food, eating out, all of that stuff is very, very expensive. Um, and hiring the clothes is, it, it's going to cost you uh, for a week about 120, 130 pounds. Mm, yeah. and actually, with that kind of money, you can buy an awful lot of what you need and probably borrow the rest. Mm. Um, I, when I, I originally ran my tours based out of Tromso, um, I've stopped doing it because Tromso has got very, very busy now in the winter. It's probably deserted now. Um, and we moved, moved to Alta because it's much quieter and it's nearer to where we need to go. And I was concerned about the clothing rental situation there. But it's not been an issue because most people have found that they can either borrow it from somewhere. I, I actually now have quite a collection of different size jackets and, and boots and things that people can borrow from me. Um, but, you, you know, thanks to eBay and stuff like that, you can actually buy the boots uh, and the undersuit, which is the main bit, really, for around about a hundred pounds anyway. So mm. it, it, savings aren't huge. Okay. No, that's some absolutely fascinating stuff. So thank you very much, Alistair. Um, if you, anyone else has any more questions at all, just leave them down in the comment section, either on the, the video on Facebook or on the YouTube comments, and we will try and get back to them um, after the fact. Um, We've also got lots more streams coming next week. Um, none of them are actually up online yet. Just I'm still finalizing some of them and um, in the process of changing up some of my technical setup here. But we will be doing a full rotor of streams next week, regardless of what happens with that. So um, keep an eye on the website for those. Um, but for now, thank you so much, Alistair. That was really good. Yep, you're welcome. So yeah, if you, if you go, good luck. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, thank you very much for watching and I'll see you next week. Access Wireless Digital is the perfect wireless audio solution for content creators and filmmakers. Thanks to a 2.4 GHz transmission, Access Wireless Digital is a truly plug-and-play system that allows you to upgrade your in-camera audio with one-button operation. With a variety of configurations to choose from, this entry point into the world of wireless will improve your workflow and will expand the possibilities of how you capture audio for your video. 
For more information, visit sennheiser.com slash xswd. This stream is powered by Wirecast, a powerful multi-input switching and graphics solution for live streaming in any situation. <laughs> 